Thanks uh, to you all for coming. Uh, I'm not fully awake. I uh, hope you are because you might fall asleep in the middle of this sometime. Uh, there's going to be some stuff about economics in here, which I've been, as John was mentioning, reading about for a while. Uh, I'm just going to, I've recently, uh, yeah, this, the title of this, it's very general, is Christianity and the New Spirit of Capitalism. And that's the, uh, I think, the subtitle. I'm trying to find a catchy title, maybe you can help me with that, uh, of a forthcoming book. Uh, but this is uh, on finance capitalism, what I'm calling finance capitalism, and the way it shapes people, their characters, their personalities, and, uh, and by way of that shaping of their persons gets them to behave in certain ways that are amenable to the present organization of capitalism. And what I'm trying to do is bring uh, Christian, Christian beliefs and practices into conversation with that kind of person that we all are in some sense or other, and try to show the way in which Christian beliefs and practices can uh, shape you in ways that would run counter to the way in which present day capitalism is trying to form you, <clears throat> primarily for the purposes of getting money out of you, uh, but also uh, maximizing uh, profit and in what follow, I'm just going to give you a snapshot, uh, one, uh, you know, an excerpt from one chapter of the book that primarily has to do with debt, very broadly construed, debt literally, but also just being indebted um, in a broader sense of that. But anyway, when I, when I talk about finance disciplined capitalism or sometimes finance dominated capitalism, what I mean by that is just uh, the present organization of capitalism where, in my judgment, finance uh, seems to be calling the shots um, and directing the way in which other non-financial organizations are run, uh, primarily for the purpose of uh, maximum efficiency and maximum profit taking. Because, yeah, that's, that's kind of an optional thing within capitalism. I mean, how much profit you make is, is somewhat optional. But I'm trying to argue earlier in the book that uh, uh, this finance discipline form of capitalism is actually pushing non-financial organizations, like just regular corporations that are making things, uh, and also governments, but also educational institutions, to try to maximize profit, however profit is being construed, in, in part to keep up with the very, very uh, large profits to be made in actual financial institutions. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a subset of Christianity and the New Spirit of Capitalism. Uh, so you bear with me. I know it's 8.30 in the morning. I'm not fully awake either, but uh, <coughs> yeah, you'll have to listen to the content. And I should say one, one further thing. Uh, the book is organized around uh, questions of time. So I'm looking at the way in which uh, what I'm calling finance dominated or finance disciplined capitalism shapes persons around uh, kind of the fundamental structures of temporality, which means just how people relate to the past, the present, and the future, how they relate to that personally, but then how they uh, relate to other people with reference to past, present, and future. So it's somewhat abstract, but you'll, you'll get the point, I think. So this uh, chapter is about debt. Uh, so one major way that finance disciplined capitalism organizes time is by magnifying the significance of the past for present and future conduct. What present and future can hold is rigidly and comprehensively determined by a past decision, whether one's own or someone else's, concerning what's to come. Present and future become, for all intents and purposes thereby, captured by the past, captive to it. Uh, the way profits are generated through debt in finance disciplined capitalism is one way this kind of temporal effect on human subjectivity is brought about. Debt is increasingly used by cash-strapped individuals to make, up, to make up for what finance disciplined corporations and governments no longer provide. A living wage on the one hand and guarantees of education and more than simple survival in times of trouble on the other. One's paycheck routinely runs out before the end of the month, requiring, to, requiring one to amass credit card debt or take out payday loans at exorbitant rates to make ends meet. The government no longer provides you with an education, <clears throat> but it best makes it easier for you to take out the loans to pay for it, and so on. And at a recent faculty retreat, our own dean mentioned, I think these are the figures, that 95% uh, of YDS students uh, are uh, requiring financial aid, 
and that uh, I think when they leave YDS, because most of them already have a BA, almost everybody, I think it's a requirement that you have a BA, uh, they have an average of almost $60,000 in debt, which is kind of a lot. The, the effects of this sort of forced debt, by which I mean debt to meet basic needs, often in conditions of hardship, the effects of this sort of forced debt are constrictive rather than expansive of future possibility, extractive of already existing value rather than productive of new value. This sort of debt simply chains individuals to highly in highly restrictive ways to the past in which they assumed it. All this, uh, I'll suggest, is not inadvertent, but a deliberate mechanism of profit generation through debt and finance-led capitalism. Much the same temporal effect on human subjectivity comes about by way of workplace restructuring to meet stock market demands for maximum profitability at the lowest possible cost, management techniques that accord with concern to increase shareholder value, that is, the people who own the stocks of that corporation. The inexorability of past decision becomes the way to get the most out of the few workers one retains on payroll to force and uh, the way to force other, other companies working at your behest to squeeze their workers. By agreeing to take out a loan or to perform a task for one's employer, one promises to abide by and therefore assumes personal responsibility for fulfilling an expectation regarding future conduct that's incre that increasingly takes on the character of an inexorable demand. Short of simple exit by declaring bankruptcy or quitting one's job, Continuing on the way set by a prior decision to which one has committed, my, committed oneself by accepting employment, say, means working for a future in strict conformity with a past decision regarding it. Every, pre, every present is past preoccupied, and nothing more is to be expected in the future than what the past has already laid down in the form of anticipation. One is bound in the present by a memory, so to speak, of the promised future by a future target set in the past, whether that target takes the form of eventual loan repayment or a work performance benchmark, to be honored in one's conduct at every moment, come what may, whatever else the future might bring. Past decisions have an inexorable quality here, in part because once signed onto, they are unalterable and inflexible, subject to no fundamental renegoti renegotiation of their terms due, for, due to unforeseen contingencies in the lives of either borrowers or workers. Indeed, making the decision to sign on to the initial terms often simply means assuming responsibility oneself for managing all future contingencies in line with that final objective one initially agreed to. Failing to manage one's life with all its risks and perils in ways that allow one, for example, to pay off one's debts, therefore means paying the price oneself. One's car is repossessed, one's house foreclosed on, with nothing to show for all those prior payments, perhaps far in excess because of high interest rates, on the car or home's actual present value. Fixing the objective without assuming responsibility for the means is typically part of the take it or leave it quality of the demanding past in finance disciplined capitalism. Do whatever it takes to meet the specified target. How one gets there is your business. So long as the target itself, which remains essentially intact and unaltered, is met within the time allowed. The work team charged with designing a new product line in two weeks is therefore free to manage itself as is the subcontractor contract, required by a lead company to deliver X number of goods at the specified quality at time T. The responsibility for such matters is simply handed over by the company to others. Because they're self-managing in responding to company demands, whatever eventualities impede satisfactory completion of company orders are laid at the feet of a company's workers or subcontractors themselves with highly moralizing effects. Expectations of future performance in this way become unsparing and unforgiving. Failures to meet previously set targets, whether the problems were foreseeable or not, whether under worker control or not, are treated as equally punishable offenses, meriting outright dismissal or loss of any future contracts for work. The past also becomes an inexorable demand under finance disciplined capitalism in that past targets for, for future performance often seem nearly impossible to meet and therefore have a highly constrictive effect on possibility f possibilities for present and future conduct. Everything else has to be sacrificed in meeting them. Demands that the past makes on the future tend to become very difficult to meet, in part because of a mis mismatch between this way of structuring time, in which the past is dominating you, and others equally typical of finance-dominated capitalism. Even as present and future conduct is bound by past decision, one finds oneself, for an example, in an extremely volatile environment 
that makes anticipations of the future highly unreliable. One commits oneself to continuous mortgage payments month after month for the next 30 years at the same time as work becomes increasingly precarious. As the likelihood of being laid off at some point in one's working life or holding merely, merely contingent part-time or on-call employment at irregular weekly or monthly wages for most of it increases. Similarly, workers are chained to the workers are chained to the past even as their employers are freed from it, retaining the right to revoke at will the initial decision to hire them, as is often the case in the United States, altering time schedules and shifting the targets that put demands on workers' time to reflect unanticipated changes in market conditions and so on. What makes meeting a target difficult, having to manage constantly changing conditions over the course of time necessary to bring a product or service to market, becomes the responsibility of employees. At least temporarily inflexible targets are required to bring any product or service to market. The costs of managing the constantly changing conditions under which those inflexible targets are pursued become the responsibility of others, a self-managing workforce or subcontractor. The difficulties faced by workers in managing volatility here are not simply the flip side of their being successfully avoided by others. Once a target, excuse me, the past refusing culture of liquidity, otherwise typical of finance discipline capitalism, has itself the direct effect of chaining workers more thoroughly to the past in production processes. Finance discipline capitalism is a culture of liquidity in that most profit generating mechanisms within it are predicated upon the refusal of constraint from, prior, from past decision. Institutional mechanisms are put in place that allow all past commitments to be constantly revisited and revised. The stock market uh, is a good example of this. By way of secondary markets like stock exchanges, any past decision to commit funds can be cashed out whenever one likes in the search for more profitable investment opportunities. That's what I mean by a culture of liquidity. Corporations disciplined by stockholder demands for maximum profitability also typically try to achieve greater profitability by breaking constraints on production posed by any preceding sunk cost. Using what are usually termed post-Fordist techniques of lean and just-in-time production to maximize profit, Corporations avoid all immobile capital expenditures that would tie their hands regarding future production, whether that immobile capital takes the form of stockpiles of components or warehouses full of finished product awaiting consumer orders or machines that make only one thing. What they've already produced or already purchased by way of equipment no longer limits the capacity of companies to respond to changes in consumer demand. They've produced only as much as is necessary to meet current orders, and they're therefore not faced with the dismal prospect of trying to sell more of what people no longer want to buy. And the machines they have can be retooled to produce new things so as to capture untapped markets or respond to changes in consumer sentiment on a dime. Nothing sits around and goes to waste, remaining unused or unsold for any length of time, and the same machines can constantly churn out product of one sort or another, switching product lines as necessary. These same post fortis techniques for make maximizing utilization of investment typically enforce human capital mobility too. What they ask of machines, corporations also ask of people. For example, rather than being constrained in what they can produce in future by past decisions to hire people with a single specialty or competence, companies require workers to be able to perform a multitude of tasks, tasks that can be varied at will depending on changing production requirements. Thus, workers need to know not simply how to work with a specific machine, but how to perform, perf per perform preventative maintenance on it. Don't put perform and preventative in the same sentence. How to perform preventative maintenance on it, how to change its components to alter its productive capacities, and how to use it just as, just as efficiently for these newly enabled purposes. The multitasking of machines is mas matched by the multitasking of workers. While all these post fortis techniques prevent a company's productive capacities from being hemmed in by past investment decisions, they have the opposite effect on workers due to the extremely tight flow in the production process they bring about. Compared with earlier assembly line production, more intensive exertion is now required from workers because the lack of stockpiles removes all slack from the production process, thereby eliminating, eliminating in principle all idle or down time. By way of computerized technologies that match orders to production in real time and regulate part of the production process accordingly, 
bottlenecks formed by the under or overproduction of components and final product no longer occur to an interrupt production flow, either in-house or in the way, on the way to, con uh, to consumers. Finished products, for example, come into the warehouse as soon as they go out, requiring a constant flow of work from those who transport stock, for example. Workers are in constant movement because the product is. And when they are at work, they are always working. The same computerized technologies that match production to, cu to customer orders in real time mean workers can be called in only when needed. Moreover, in contrast to earlier forms of production line assemb assembly where slacking off could be hidden, this was always a problem, management was always trying to <laughs> catch the slacking off workers, any lapse in the constant exertion required by tight flow in the production process is immediately evident to all. Because the flow has no slack in it, the flow of product, the flow of the production line, because the flow has no slack in it, flow is fragile and unforgiving of failures in compliance. One misstep and the whole line stops. In all these ways, the past, starting with the initial customer order and proceeding through all the production stages prior to the one you are responsible for, takes on the character of a continu continuously exercised, inescapable, and unrelenting pressure. Put more simply and more generally, to cover all sorts of work and not simply assembly line production and distribution flows, one can say that in finance-dominated capitalism, the setting of nearly impossible demands is an intentional strategy for extracting the greatest possible effort from workers. Pressure from shareholders for maximum profitability means making do with less. Pay payrolls are cut to the bone to reduce costs as much as possible, and that means fewer workers are now required to perform, to perform the same tasks that a far greater number of them did before. Uh, under stock market pressures for increasing returns on investments, companies also typically set ever more difficult tasks for their employees to force greater productivity and performance, their more efficient use of time, they're doing more at a quicker pace. What workers are asked to do becomes, in short, nearly impossible to achieve unless they're willing to work constantly and with enormous intensity. Setting nearly impossible demands is also a typical me mechanism for cost company and companies that reorganize their operations using a core periphery model. And a really good book on this is uh, one by uh, David Weil uh, called The Fis Fissured Workplace. The most profitable, mo this, I'm just gonna describe a core per periphery model, you probably know this, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, the most profitable parts, the core parts of the business are retained in house, while the least profitable profitable parts are outsourced or made the responsibility of subcontractors so as to form a periphery around the lead company purchasing their service or uh, product inputs. The design and marketing teams, the front office pulling the deals, are the ones adding the most valuable value and responsible most directly for making all the money. They're to be retained as company employees. The janitors and maintenance, maintenance staff, along with those performing data entry and providing payroll services, all workers performing so-called inessential functions are merely costs of production or final service provision to be outsourced or employed by other companies, even if they work in-house. Indeed, every aspect of production between design and sale, the actual assembly of all the parts, every function that enables the front office deal making is to be subcontracted or outsour outsourced. All these subsidiary products and services that contribute to the lead company's own eventual provision of a product or service, whether it be an Apple computer or a bond issue, still have to be paid for, but their costs have now been minimized. They cost far less than they would have if the work had been done by the company's own employees. This is simply a function of market competition. All the many companies capable of providing what the lead company now buys compete with one another for its business, therefore driving down prices. If janitors were paid in-house, their pay would be, for a variety of reasons, you can read David Weil's book on this, their pay would be far higher than if they were supplied by other companies on the open market. Given the number of companies competing for its business, there are very few entrance hurdles to cleaning service startups, for example, so there are a lot of these companies, the lead company can easily bargain down the price for janitorial services. Indeed, pressured by shareholders for maximum profitability, companies more or less easily, depending on their market share, set a take it or leave it rock bottom price beyond which they refuse to budge for janitorial services, say. The profit margins on these sub firms, the janitorial 
firms, are typically quite low in any case. That's in great part why direct responsibility for providing their products and services has been shed by the lead company. But now those profit margins are forced even lower by lead company price demands to a near breaking point, if at all possible, beyond which lies simple failure to return any profit at all. Besides forcing lower the wages of employees of subcontractors, employees are often paid, in, in fact, below minimum wage in violation of labor standards, the near impossible price demand made by lead companies puts pressure on subcontractors to hire the minimum number of workers and to work them as hard as possible, often, again, in violation of labor laws, like unpaid overtime. For example, employees may, well, yeah, for example, employees may routinely be forced to work before and after their official shifts without pay. This is a very common tactic. Pressured to reduce payroll costs, subcontractors may also employ the same core periphery cost-cutting strategies that the lead companies are using. They may become, for example, merely the brand organizers for collections of smaller cleaning outfits, and in that way increase their own profit margins by squeezing those of their franchises. Profits are in this way forced even lower as one proceeds down the resulting nest of suppliers. The closer to the lead company, the greater the profit margins, with the lead company itself making an outsized return on investment because they've shed all these, uh, yeah. And as the profit margins shrink along the chain responding to initial lead company demands, the greater the pressure put on workers to make do with less and to work even harder. While the lead company itself and its direct suppliers make sufficient profits to be able to afford to hire more employees and work them less intensely, it's simply part of this business, business model not to do so because they have an interest in maximum profitability enforced by shareholder value. You get the, it's pretty coherent. The target of maximum profitability set by finance forbids that. In this way, nearly impossible demands for maximum exertion from workers come to bridge the whole supply chain from top to bottom. You can see why this would not be <laughs> very pleasant to be employed in this sort of supply chain. The setting of nearly impossible demands for profit generating purposes is also typical of the way debt functions in finance discipline capitalism. One might think loans would be profitable only when they have a good chance of being paid. Uh, loans, one might think, are made in order to be repaid with profits generated by way of the difference between the interest payments due, on, due to the creditor over time and the costs of generating the funds that were loaned. That's the usual business model. If prof profits are primarily predicated on repayment, one wouldn't want to stretch the borrower's sources of income so far through indebtedness as to jeopardize the repayment. And one would loan with the expe expectation that borrowed funds would prove profitable to the borrower since those profits might prove the prime source of funds for loan repayment. This all, would all make sense. In conditions of finance disciplined capitalism, to the contrary, difficulty in meeting the demand to pay them off seems a major part of their point. Indeed, maximum difficulty, pointing, pushing to the edge of borrower insolvency becomes something of an ideal. We, we saw that, this in the uh, recent, well, it's not so recent, now, the financial crisis having to do with subprime mortgages. This is in part, you know, the ideal of near insolvency of the debtor, uh, become, it, um, that's in part because profit is generated not by way of the slow trickle of interest and principal payments by borrowers to loan originators, but by repackaging such loans into bonds for immediate sale to investors. The higher the interest rate paid to investors in such bonds, the greater their attractiveness to them. And this requires the interest rates on the original loans to be as high as possible. Uh, near, but not tipping over into what be, what's just simply beyond borrower's ability to pay. Financially strapped borrowers with low, credit scores, with low credit scores become in this way prime lending targets. They can be charged higher interest rates along with hefty fees to compensate for greater default risk. And you can see how this is uh, you know, ripe for abuse, and it was, and it continues to be. Their actual defaulting would not be a good thing, at least if it happened quickly ac across the board in ways that might spook the investors in such bonds. To delay the inevitable, even more money can be lent to persons at risk of defaulting. These are usually people with precarious employment and already poor. To delay the inevitable, even more money can be lent to persons at risk of defaulting, say beyond the value of any collateral at the time of the initial loan, so, the, so that the extra itself is available to pay the interest on the loans until it runs out. 
And when those extra funds do evaporate, the initial loan can be rolled over, thereby adding to one's own original indebtedness. The second-hand car one bought with borrowed money at high interest rates breaks down. One can't get to work without it because there's no public transport. And absent a paycheck, one is in jeopardy of defaulting on the payments still owed on that loan. One takes out an even bigger loan at even higher rates to pay off the first loan, therefore, and purchase another car, and so on. One is unable to make ends meet at the end of the month on one's meager salary as the employee of a cleaning company franchise, and therefore one takes out a payday loan at sky-high interest rates. But if one struggled to make ends meet without a loan, that effort becomes even more difficult with loan uh, payments to make on top of one's regular expenses for food and housing, requiring a new loan of a larger amount at perhaps even higher interest rates. And so it goes. Indefinite extension of indebtedness until eventual default. At some point, the diversion of funds that might otherwise be used for food and shelter from people of limited means reaches its limit in default. Indefinite extension without ultimate end, being chained to one's debt until defeated by it, seems endemic to the primary mechanism of profit generation here. Uh, not good. Rather than expanding possibilities for profit on the part of borrowers as one's primary avenue for generating revenues to pay back loans, debt here as elsewhere in finance disciplined capitalism has a contractive and expropriating effect. Debt means poor people find it harder rather than easier to live well. Clearly payday loans and loans for consumption purposes generally when assumed by cash-strapped borrowers don't lend a hand out of poverty but keep people in it. Money that could have been used to pay for food and housing now, go, now goes to service a debt whose high interest rate prevents one from ever repaying. Just that much less in the amount equal to what's demanded for debt servicing remains unavailable for essential expenses, forcing extremes of self-management from the poor who are already pretty stressed in, in the effort to cope with increased extremes of austerity demanded by growing debt. The assumption of debt by government has the same contractive and constricting effects, making the past a dead weight rather than an opening to a future beyond it. Revenues from taxation are designed to enable government service provision in the form of parks and infrastructure, construction, educational opportunities, programs to ensure the well-being of uh, the state's citizens, and so on. Generating revenue through debt on the open market, through the issuing of bonds, treasury bonds, T-bills, et cetera, has the opposite effect, especially when such debt is issued to cover shortfalls in tax revenue, which are there usually are because taxes have been cut. Less money is available for service provi provision and more money is diverted to debt servicing. Government service provision has to contract by an amount equal to that required for debt servicing rather than being uh, helped to expand by way of it. You see the analogy between a poor person and uh, the way poor people are stripped of their cash and the way uh, austerity programs work. Viewed by the community of creditors, uh, yeah, yeah. this contraction of service provision, sorry, is viewed by the community of creditors as a salutary development in any case, i.e. the people buying treasury bonds, uh, whatever the economic conditions, insofar as it forces government efficiencies via cost cutting, fewer government employees and redundant agencies, indeed less service provision altogether, i.e. austerity, uh, which in the case of government, service provision is a cost against revenue rather than as in the service industry, industry a source of profit. So you get the idea. I mean, yeah, if you, yeah, okay. Pressured by the debt they've assumed in hard times, governments are to be run more productively, which reassures their creditors about their, their private creditors, about their likely solvency and future and continued ability to make payment on their bonds. Only efficiently run governments, which means governments run like finance disciplined corporations so as to cut costs to the bone, are deemed credit worthy on the open market. Indeed, the model here is the way companies are forced into efficiencies by difficulty in servicing debt. And this is the last example here, I think. What, you, get the, you get the sense of how this all fits together. When companies are taken over by investors trying to make money through the purchase and sale of those companies, companies are saddled with the debt used to purchase them. And that puts immediate pressure on their revenue streams. Prior to being taken over by, say, a private equity firm that borrowed money to purchase, purchase it using the company itself as collateral, the company may have typically sold enough to cover costs of production, meet employee payrolls, and turn a profit. Now, because it also has to service the debt used to acquire it by private equity firms, 
Revenues are quite possibly no longer sufficient for such purposes. The company can try to increase revenues dramatically, but that's difficult to do and takes time. The quick fix is to cut costs most easily by way of company employees, by shedding them and lowering the pay and benefits of the, of the ones that they are retained on payroll. In this way, employees are expropriated, one might say, in order to pay company creditors. Okay, finally, <laughs> okay, here's a, yeah. Finally, yeah, we're nearing the final part of this horrible, uh, you know, coherent, you know, it's like, uh, antichrist, no, not really, don't quote me on that. Are we filmed? Anyway, finally, the, the demands of the past are inexorable here, whether by way of debt or weak workforce reorganization, in that the whole of life is consumed in the attempt to meet them. The whole of life must be dedicated to their service just because they're so difficult to meet otherwise. Debt, when it's forced by need and not simply a matter of convenience, always has this disciplining effect on the whole of life, inclusive of both work and leisure. Every other decision in one's life, no matter how small, is affected. Should I really have this expensive cup of coffee or buy this brand name sweater for my child, given the growing monthly minimum payment on my credit card, etc.? One is promised to reorganize the whole of one's life as both a worker and consumer to meet the demands of debt in this general sense. Every aspect of one's life is potentially relevant to one's ability to service the debt and will in fact become so relevant the more difficult it, e it is to make the payments on that debt. But work demands tend to become just as life consuming as debt under finance dominated forms of company reorganization. Because demands set in the past for future performance are so difficult to meet and because there's no downtime at work that could be used to catch up on work that one's fallen behind on, work tends to bleed into time off. One spends longer hours at work trying to complete tasks on time. It's after hours one should be at home, but one stays at work until the wee hours in the morning in an attempt to meet a deadline. And time away from the office on nights and weekends is increasingly dedicated to completing what simply couldn't be finished at work, try as one might. The extreme pressures of past demands on future performance in this way come to colonize every working moment. Okay, that's the picture of finance-dominated capitalism when it comes to debt. Okay, now given what I, uh, what I hope to have shown is the generally unfortunate character of this particular temporal restructuring of human subjectivity within uh, finance-dominated capitalism where the past is really cap uh, capturing uh, present and future, at least for a lot of people. How could you disrupt it? One might try to disrupt it by scanning the historical record for alternative models of human subjectivity, alternative ways of relating to the past in this case. They could put this one in its place and show it to be merely a contingent historical development, uh, i.e. unnecessary and maybe we could get rid of it. If viable now, if supported by forms of community of life extending into the present, these alternative forms of subjectivity could in fact, or subject formation, could in fact provide potential avenues for active resistance to finance dominated capitalism in the present, or at least this form of restructuring of human subjectivity so that the past becomes, you get the part. Um, in the rest of my time today, I uh, hope it won't go that, that far, uh, maybe, well, anyway. In the rest of my time today, I'll propose ways of structuring the temporal dimensions of human subjectivity uh, that are aligned with Christian, some Christian ways of structuring, structuring the temporal, temporal dimensions of human subjectivity that might uh, suggest a, a way out if they were taken seriously. And I'm assuming that some Christians take them seriously, at least. Anyway, uh, on this way, this Christian way of looking at things, rather than determining a future target, the past is problematized and often radically so. One is counseled simply to repudiate it. One is not to be what one was before, the sort of person one committed oneself to being or becoming in the past. Moreover, in contrast to expectations of some seamless way from here to there, from past target to future realization, for a variety of religious reasons, sharp discontinuities are properly thought to break the hold of the past on present and future conduct. This may be partly a functioning of the dis disreputable character of the past. Past and future conduct can't be joined in any continuous fashion, just to the degree the past is what's to be left behind because it was so bad. But even when past targets remain in some sense normative for future conduct, something about that target prevents expectation of continuous progress towards it, often requiring something of a discontinuous leap across a divide. 
The past, of course, is sometimes considered by Christians to be something of great value, indeed taken to represent an ideal to which present and future conduct are to conform. So the position on Christianity that I'm going to give you is not always what Christians say. Uh, on this other view, where the past is a kind of norm, where one has been but is no longer determines where one is going. Being saved means returning to a lost origin, recovering the ideal form of oneself as God originally knew it, or the state of Adam and Eve's conformity with God's will before the fall. Who one was, whether in God or prolept proleptically in Adam and Eve, who one, is to be is who one is to become again with God's help, and one is to exert oneself to the utmost now by way of God's grace to, brings, to bring one's life in, in, to, in its entirety back into line with that ideal lost past. Much of this is simply a platonic leg legacy following in Christian form the past preoccupations of, of a platonic model for structuring human subjectivity. But I don't think Platonism is a bad thing. I actually am a Christian Platonist, so don't get too excited at this point. <laughs> Uh, on this uh, Christian kind of platonic uh, view, there exists an ideal for human life to be imitated now that was once enjoyed to the full and that one can one day return to. One lived the life of the gods before falling to earth, either literally or figuratively, and the struggle now is to return to the life one once knew. Such a model does bring with it a certain suspicion of the past and a disjunctive temporality that breaks continuity with the future, even though that future has the form of a past. All that one has been since that time of origin, all the commitments to worldly matters that have made one what one is since the fall are to be repudiated. There might exist a continuous ladder back to the past, made possible, say, by the way ideal forms are variously manifest in the material, move, uh, material world. One moves by stages for Plato himself from beautiful bodies to beautiful ideas. But at some point, one jumps suddenly out of this whole realm of embodied preoccupations into a different one, an intelligible world where one contemplates poor, pure forms themselves. Depending on the state into which one has fallen and the seriousness of the impediments it presents for return, no perfectly continuous process of return might be possible, requiring divine intervention to, be, to bring future into line with the past. Simple ignorance of origins, for example, might prevent return apart from a saving knowledge brought to the material world from without, as in Gnosticism. Or the state of the light within material existence might be so fragmented, so dissipated, as to obstruct all efforts to collect itself without a new infusion of light from beyond, as in some Christian forms of Manichaeism. But the close association of ideal self with divinity within a Platonic model tends to mean that what one was is never fully lost, and that therefore the way back to origins is in principle, and most fundamentally, a matter of continuous progress. One did not simply exist in a divine state originally. One has a divine nature. Because divinity constitutes one's essential identity, this is on the Platonic view, it can't be fully lost in one's fallen state. For all the corruption of character that may have prompted the fall, or that may ensue one's fallen, one remains fundamentally what one was before, one's divine self but now in a very bad situation, in hostile circumstances. When one repudiates what one has become since the fall, one therefore isn't repudiating oneself, certainly not in any wholesale way, but simply the conditions under which one presently exists and their unwholesome effects on one. Remaining divine in some significant sense, one retains moreover the means for return to a state in which one's divinity will be fully manifest and free from taint. What one is to become, in other words, builds on what one remains. Salvation often indeed suggests nothing more than a simple purification from foreign influences, the stripping away of external accretions that enables one to become more fully what one already essentially is, to effect a kind of consolidation of who one has always truly been. Bringing one's present and future into strict alignment with one's past self, salvation means one's past self simply means one's past self, now protected from harm, delivered from threat. Now, to the contrary of all this, uh, uh, and now we're getting to my view, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, now, in contrast to that way of understanding Christianity, uh, Christian affirmations of the merely created, non-divine nature of humans, they usually say that, uh, I say that too, means that if humans enjoyed some sort of perfect unity with God's intentions for them before their creation or at their first creation in paradise, what they enjoyed then 
can be completely lost. The perfection that was once theirs was not theirs by nature, but accrued to them by virtue of that very unity with God. If sin breaks that relationship with God, perfection can simply be replaced by total corruption, is the Protestant part. Uh, made to exist in unity with God, humans without God have their lives turned upside down. They become the opposite of what they should be. If they were once light in and through God's light, the Manichaean kind of thing, they now find themselves in total darkness. Salvation then means the complete repudiation of what has one, complete repudiation of what one has become through sin. What has organized one's whole life and is turning away from God is now to be forfeited. One must simply renounce what one has become by turning away from the past of sin and becoming something entirely new. Humans, once lost in their complete corruption without God, now found with God because, what of, because of what Christ accomplishes to their unsurpassable benefit. Rather than being some continuous progress or process, the passage from the one state to another is like a passage through death. One dies to one's old self, an old self whose life amounted to a kind of death, in order to be born again into another life. Such a rebirth means no resuscitation of a corpse, but entrance into an entirely new manner of human existence enlivened by God's own life. Such a passage is therefore enabled by nothing that remains to the creatures, nothing that remains the creatures own under conditions of sin, but comes by grace alone, the grace of Christ who reconciles, who brings us back into unity, uh, into unity with God, uh, who brings back into unity with God what has been separated from God to its own absolute detriment. The conversion or turning away into at issue here is a kind of participation in Christ's own death and resurrection a dying to the world and rising with him, and in its extremity is akin to one's own death and resurrection to come. One's life of sin can no more contribute to one's new life to come than can one's body riding away in the grave to one's resurrection. The life force completely lost by way of one's own death, the utter corruption of the grave, will be made up for by the empowering, empowering spirit of God's own life, and in this case to come. Or the passage in question might be likened to the release or cancellation of an enslaving debt, one that is otherwise impossible to remit by way of one's own resources. Sin can itself be considered a sort of unpaid debt in that what one has failed to make good on, God has provided for one. One has defaulted on the obligation to act in accord with God's own intentions for one in ways that can no longer be remedied through one's own efforts, every such attempt simply bringing one into greater debt because of one's fundamental corruption. One needs God here. Sin in this way eventuates in a kind of debt slavery imprisoning one within the debt that is sin itself, making it impossible to repay a kind of unrelenting bondage. The transition out of debt is consequently quite abrupt. No gradual repayment from within prison walls brings about one's release from its prison. That release comes suddenly from unexpected quarters in ways that, canceled, that cancel your own need to pay. Christ becomes the strange currency or treasure, following some passages of Matthew, that allows one now to make good in one's obligations to God, and in that way, Christ breaks one's bondage to sin. The fact of such serious, serious gaps in the passage from old life to new is made clear in peculiar forms of Christian self-narration, retrospective, one, retrospective ones. What's to come can't be told prospectively, prospectively, that is, looking forward from the standpoint of the past and present towards the future to come. Because of the une unexpected twists and turns to come, there's no way to get from here to there, starting from the past and making it the basis for projection about what the future will hold. Only from the standpoint of an otherwise unanticipated outcome can one look back and retell the story of one's life in ways that make sense of such an outcome by interjecting, where necessary, elements of complete surprise. Now that I know how I've ended up, saved from sin, I can see how unbeknownst to me, and often contrary to my own intentions, God was working on my behalf to bring me where I otherwise could not have brought myself. And Augustine's Confessions would be a kind of model here. Uh, well, I'm going to skip some of this, which is pretty interesting about biblical interpretation. Too bad. You'll have to read the book. Um, <laughs> But what I'm get, basically getting at here is that Christian forms of self-narration and also historical narration tend to include uh, these very discontinuous jumps that involve uh, complete surprise, not just in your own life, but 
in the history of uh, God's people. So, you know, the usual, you know, in the history of God's people. That Christ's uh, coming, what Christ is doing, is highly un unanticipatable. Uh, and you can't blame anybody for not being able to anticipate it. That's sort of its point, that it's only retrospectively that you can look back and say, oh, God is a God of surprises, and God was a God of surprises in the Old Testament too, and God is being continuous with who God really is, but involves discontinuous jumps and surprises and breaks in continuity. Um, all right, I'm going to skip that part. This is the problem when you skip parts, then you can't remember where you, <laughs> where you should start again. Um, but the, the bottom line here has to do with uh, conversion, conversion as a jump uh, that goes by way of death, that, that is a radical repudiation of who you were before and the offer of new life in Christ that you haven't brought, out, brought about yourself, but comes by way of something that's been done for you. Um, so that it's not just the discontinuous jump, but uh, the, you know, from, from death to life, but that there's a lack of continuity in the, in the process. So let me just develop that a little bit more. Because the sin from which, I've, uh, from which I'm converted remains, even as I'm propelled out of bondage to it by way of new relationship with, Christ, with God and Christ. So that's one of the reasons why this isn't a continuous process, because sin remains and is often possibly worse than it was before in some ways, because you know just how bad you're being in the light of Christ. The state of grace to which I'm converted initiates no cumulative process of simple incremental improvement. The better I am, oh, here I go. The better I am by way of the effects of God's grace upon me, the more serious my continuing uh, failing becomes, the farther I have to fall in my own ongoing moral imperfection. I continue to confess my sin, not simply because I haven't yet achieved enough in the effort to lead a reformed life, but as a reminder of the simple, simple sinner I remain apart from Christ in recognition of my utter dependence upon Christ for all that uh, I am that's good. That's just a simile used to set peccator of you. Conversion does mean that then uh, being set on a new path oneself, well, sorry, conversion does, this is why you should never interrupt your, yeah. conversion does not mean then being set on a new path oneself, absent one form, one's former sins destroyed in Christ, being left with a now clean blank slate to make the most of oneself through one's own renewed efforts to conform one's will to God. One's converted self does not, in other words, itself amount to a past which, to which one's future is chained in impossible uh, ex expectation of perfection. I'm drawing the parallel between workplace environments. God is not your employer. <laughs> it doesn't, uh, and here I'm quoting uh, another scholar, it doesn't create for the believer, grace doesn't create for the believer, a life of obligation which must be persistently fulfilled in the anxious effort to preserve the purity of one's initial converted state at baptism, for example. So here I'm criticizing some other Christian views. One's baptism does not mean one's former sins are washed away so as to put one under the obligation of leading a blameless life thereafter. The grace of Christ in this way receding behind the demand to fulfill the tasks which baptism imposes. Such a demand would always be threatened by lapses into sin after baptism, requiring constant self-vigilance from the believer in either the futile attempt to prevent such lapses altogether or to atone for them subsequently. Post-baptismal sin would in this way bring one once again, would in that way bring one once again into God's debt, a debt to be forgiven by way of heartfelt confession and repentance or to be remitted by value of one's compensatory future good deeds. The salvation that Christ brings would become in that way a kind of advance on what one is eventually to pay for oneself through holy living. God would become one's creditor again in Christ, loaning salvation on the expectation of being paid back by the good works that Christ made possible. Uh, but what most fundamentally disrupts the idea of one's grace state posing an impossible demand on future conduct is the fact that what one is indeed asked to achieve is already one's own in Christ. Living in Christ, one is righteous because of Christ's righteousness, whatever the state of one's own, which is usually not so hot. While certainly to be struggled against, post-baptismal sin, sin after baptism, sin after conversion, is also something to be expected. One is saved while a sinner still. Post-baptismal sin, like the sin that came before it, thereby, thereby loses its power to threaten salvation that comes by way of life in Christ. One is united to Christ and thereby saved, whatever the degree of one's continuing sinfulness and despite sin's ongoing presence in one's life. What God asks of us from the beginning may well be impossible. 
perfect, perfect conformity with God's own will. I think that's what God is asking. One cannot perhaps hope to imitate the righteousness of God in our own deeds by way of the created goods that constitute simply human life, but only by way of God's own spirit empowering their performance. Radical discontinuity may in that way exist between what we are given in the beginning and what we're to achieve in the end, but God is the one who bridges the difference. God will supply the means to take us from the future target set for us in the past to its eventual realization, not just before baptism, but ever after. Thanks so much. Yeah, all right. Five minutes for conversation. Okay. There is some time. John, is there time for conversation? We have five minutes for conversation. All right. Make them good. So, uh, back to the actual capitalist finance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first part. Economy. Yeah, which kind of dominated the whole what, talk. Yeah. This, so, we, we went from there to this understanding of salvation. Of right, 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 right. So, I mean, you can see you, the parallels that I'm trying back, to make. How right. do we get back to do something about the people who are enslaved by that economy? Well, the point of my talk is to just see that, uh, to get Christians primarily to, I mean, part of the, t the purpose of the book is to get, help people to see what's going on in their own world, right? And it, it's not a pretty picture. And I'm laying it out in very simple terms so it all sort of hangs together in this, you know, kind of prison-like way, <laughs> which I think it actually does. But at any rate, some people find me too pessimistic. But um, the, the point is to address uh, Christians primarily and to say that, look, Christian witness expects something different from you. You're being uh, kind of, uh, in a way that seems impossible to escape, being asked to do certain things, being told to reorganize your whole life, say, in order to, uh, to repay debts that, that can't be repaid. And you're to see that your, your Christian beliefs and practices tell you that's wrong, apart from you know, the horrible effects of this on people, you know, like wealth concentration or whatever, you know, extremes and inequality. Your Christian beliefs and practices are also telling you this is wrong and Christians should not be acting this way. So then it just sets up, uh, you know, kind of subjects, uh, counter subjects, counter practices. Exactly what that might look like is, uh, you know, a story for another day. It's just that Christians are called to do something, to do something to uh, no longer be complicit in this way of uh, gaining profits from people, often from the most vulnerable people, and basically taking you know, the little that people have, because if you do this for a million people, even if you take a penny from them, if you take it from a billion people, you're, you're still talking about a heck of a lot of money. So that you, you're called to see how the system works and to interrupt it. That's the point. Yeah, right there. Well, a lot of corporate re leader, leaders are Christian, actually, and are wondering what, what are the implications. Well, I, I, well, I think people know that there's something wrong. Uh, they, they, uh, you know, they see that there's something wrong here. I mean, often it's hard to see that there's something wrong, especially if you're profiting from it. You know, profiting from it makes it, you know, kind of hard to see that there's anything wrong here. Uh, but they know something's wrong. Um, but yeah, I mean, I talk to Christian leaders of corporations, and often the, the move that I think is most often made is to say, okay, the system is corrupt, you know, okay, it is ripe for abuse. But I'm a Christian, and I'm not, I'm not going to do that. So if I'm the chairman, I've talked to like former CEOs of Goldman Sachs, and what they say is, well, I just hire moral people. You know, we don't have to worry about this. You know, everything you say is true, but all we need is to hire moral people, and then things will be fine. And obviously that doesn't work because the incentive structure here is so overwhelming that you would have to be a saint to avoid this. And people are, in my view, not saints. They, they occasionally are saintly, but not very often. Uh, yeah, you want to call on? Uh, there are a couple of hands. You take charge, John. Okay. So in the middle there, you. <laughs> John. <laughs> Yeah, sure. It's fundamentally rooted in greed. Well, which means that you can own your house. Yep, yep. Today, yep. rather than saving for 30 years. Yeah, no, it could be rooted in greed. Yeah, I wouldn't put that past people because, as I say, there are very few saints. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of greed out there on everybody's part. A second observation. 
Yeah. Which is that your assertions uh, in the chapter on that yeah. are subject to empirical Oh, yes, they are. They are. And I would suggest if you want to make a forceful case there, yeah. that you bring the, that uh, data. Oh, yeah. It's in the book. A lot of data. Data. Maybe too much data. Yeah. No, there's a lot of data. I mean, what I said in the we, maybe we can follow up afterwards. But yeah, the stuff that I said in the in the first part. I mean, I'm not an economist. I get this from economists. So uh, in the book, it's uh, cited. But of course, these are controversial judgments, and they are empirically disconfirmable. I'm yeah. going to take two more at the back in pink and then in the front. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that was the point I was making, that they're yeah. deliberately pushed towards bankruptcy. Yes, yes, and I wonder if you had any reflections on um, similarities and differences between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, and how that might be jubilee. Yeah, there are obvious uh, parallels there. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I think that's all to the good, the jubilee movements that had to do not just with... Uh, you know, personal debt, but sovereign nation debt and things like that, you know, unfair debt that, you know, you can't get out of. Uh, yeah, debt forgiveness, basically. Yeah. But what I'm trying to do in the chapter is um, expand the meaning of debt. So it's not just literal debt, but you could be a person working for a corporation, have no debt whatsoever because you have enough money to pay, you know, you, know, you can use cash. I mean, in New York City, like people buy $20 million apartments with cash. Uh, they're not debt strapped in that sense, but they might be chained to the past in other respects. And this doesn't go across the board because, as I say, uh, finance dominated capitalism is uh, in great part a culture of liquidity. Somebody is moving out of investments very quickly with no obligations whatsoever to anybody, and certainly not chained to their past decisions. Uh, there are all kinds of institutional mechanisms to avoid them. But I'm trying to expand the range of what, what it means to be in debt so that most like white-collar workers could be in debt, chained to, chained to the past in the same way as somebody who's taken out a payday loan uh, and can't ever pay it back. So I'm trying to you know, create solidarity across uh, class to economic differences. And that's why Jubilee stuff wouldn't be sufficient. Uh, I don't know the figures, but it's uh, it's probably as high as the number of people in poverty. It's quite high. And I think it's completely uh, unacceptable. I mean, I don't think Christians should be invested in paying loan lending. Uh, there have been some you know, changes to the system, but they're just little band-aids having to do with how loans are rolled over and things like that. So if there are other questions, perhaps you could come and talk yeah, to Yeah, sure. Us. I'd be happy to talk to people. But thanks for listening. Thank